104. Psalms 104. And we'll begin in just a moment there. But uh, I want to remind you that we started a new series last week. And uh, I, will, I will have to be honest with you. It's probably last week's sermon. It's probably one of the most enjoyable ones for me that I, I can remember in quite some time preach. So enjoyable that I was tempted to completely just go all over it with you again. Uh, it was just so many. Those of you didn't get to hear it last week, then next week, hopefully last week and this week, will be up on the web page uh, with a group in India gone and, and a few other folks and all. Uh, we're not getting up on the web until next week. But go back and listen to that uh, because I believe that it tells how awesome how magnificent, how wonderful is our God. And that's what I want you to hear all the time. I want you to dwell on those kind of things on a regular basis. The series that we've begun is the Lord of Creation. And the overall arching theme for the series is found in Romans, first chapter, the 20th verse, and then each week with a new title we'll have a text verse as well. But the overall arching theme, this verse sort of really sums up for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power, His divine nature have been clearly seen. Now think about that for a minute, what that says. That since the creation of the world, God's invisibleness, His eternal power, His divine nature has been clearly seen. It's invisible, but it's been clearly seen. How is that? being understood in the form of what has been made so that people are without excuse. God wants to make so clear to us even that which is invisible to us so that we will have no excuse but to do what we were created to do. And that is to worship Him. Amen? And this morning's verse. Now, I, like I said, I, I'm so tempted. I started last week off with... Uh, have you ever wondered if there's intelligent life out there? Have you ever wondered that? And then I went on to prove that there is intelligent life out there. Beyond earth, there's intelligent life. And that that life form is higher than that of humanity. And we use the verse in Hebrews, the second chapter, the ninth verse. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels. When Jesus took on humanity, when he, be, when he came from heaven to earth and took on humanity, he took on a state a little bit lower than the angels, didn't he? For a little while, the scripture says. He took on a form lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. So we concluded that these Awesome, not all powerful, but these powerful beings, these beings who, when confronted by man, many times fall as though dead. It doesn't say that the angels killed them, but they fall as though dead. They can't move. They're just alive and rigorous. Others have knelt as to worship these beings. These beings are awesome. They're powerful, but they're not all powerful. And what we find is they were created to praise our common creator. They worship. They are powerful so much so that we're afraid when we enter their presence. And yet they recognize that they were created for the purpose of worshiping our creator. How much more we should conclude that if these intelligent life sources worship our creator, we too should worship our Creator. But this morning, before we fully get into our text here, which, by the way, is in Psalms 104, verse 31. Are you there yet? Let me give you another little commercial break. Give you time to find that. God is all-powerful and limitless in His ability to create. And He creates for the purpose of His pleasure. The scripture says very clearly, God didn't get it almost right. He didn't get close to how he had imagined it. God nailed it. He created that which he created for his pleasure. In Psalms 104, 
says, May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in His work. In other words, His work brings Him great joy. He rejoices in it. And we'll discover a little bit more about that. But let me tell you about this funny thing that I read this last week. Have any of you ever heard, studied about, or in any way come across a European water spider? A European water spider I read about this week lives at the bottom of a lake, but it breathes air. So what it has to do, this little teeny spider, is go up to the surface of the water, do a flip, and in doing that flip, it catches a little air bubble, bringing it to its breathing ports in the middle of its body. It swims all the way back down to the bottom of the lake and spins its web and then goes back up to the top and retrieves another bubble one after another, after another, after another, until it has a balloon like of air down there to where it can live and eat and mate at the bottom of the lake. Wow! That's exactly what I wrote in my notes! Wow! Absolutely. I believe God smiled. It says, Timothy, Mitch, and a few of the other you said, wow, I've been enjoying this for thousands of years before you even knew it existed, before you ever heard of such a thing. And how many other millions of things do you think would make you go, wow, that God has been enjoying for so, so very long because he created it for his pleasure. How many millions of things are we going to Come to understand. God has created a vastness, a wonderfulness in the universe where we are not even nearly aware of all of the awesome things that He's created. Because God takes pleasure in His creation. Let's look at the authentication of this in Genesis 1. You don't have to turn there. You remember the story. Surely you remember the Genesis story. In the very first chapter, God describes not only the order of his creation, but he also records for us his response. Five times we see in the first chapter of Genesis where God has created what he has created and his response to it. In verse 4, verse 12, and verse 18, verse 21, verse 25 of the first chapter. said. So, God says, God saw what he had created and said, it is good. It is good. And after the creation of humanity, after the creation of Adam and Eve, the male and the female created in his image, God looked at everything that he had made and he said, it is very good. God is delighted in his work. When he looks at it, it brings him joy. I love those scriptures. It says that we are a sweet, sweet sound in his ear. I went and heard my grandson this weekend. got over there for a little while, you know, and I heard some squeals. I heard some noises that were uninterpretable. And every single one of them I loved. Oh, do it again. Do it again. I go over tickling if I can get him to do it again. But I can remember days with my own children. But I have to confess, not every noise that they were making was a sweet, sweet sound. Can you please keep that quiet down? And which are we going to be? Are we going to be the creation that God says, you're a sweet, sweet sound in my ear. You're a sweet savor in my nostrils. You're beautiful in my sight. Well, what determines that is whether or not we're fulfilling the purpose for which we were created. But that's next week's turn. We'll come back to us later. Why is it important for us to understand that God gains pleasure or gets joy from his creation. Why, do you suppose? I think the closer we get to understanding what brings God great joy, what, what causes him to take pleasure, then the more we'll understand the character of God. Different people want the same things for different reasons. And the reason they want it reveals their character exposes their motives, 
it enlightens us as to who they really are. Well, I think that that's a good reason to figure out what it is that God wants, what it is that God delights in. The reason for God's joy in His work is the fact that they are the expressions of His glory. God's work is the expression of His glory. As long as the glory of the Lord endures in His creation, God will indeed rejoice in His work. Now I'll tell you, I thought about this week when I was, when I was doing this. I thought about, I like watches. I have several, I don't have just one. I'm blessed, my father-in-law left me a few too. He's not gone yet, but he left me the watches to enjoy now. This particular one, I remember when I first got it, I got two or three from him at once, and most of them needed batteries. And I went down, got batteries, put in all of them, and they couldn't open this one. And, Man, I really like that one. I'd like to wear that one, but no battery in it, so I put it away, and it was like six months or so later. I thought, you know, I'm going to give it another try. Maybe another watch place will be able to open it. And I took it in, and I said, you know, is there any way you can make this thing work? And I said, yeah, there you go. <laughs> Don't you need to put a new battery in? He said, no, it says right here, automatic. <laughs> Intricate workings of a watch. Beautiful. Every single thing must just go in place perfectly in order for it to look good on my wrist. In order for it to tell time. We have to remember, no matter how many jewels it has in it, no matter what color of metal or if it has a leather band, that the purpose of a watch is to tell time, is to record for us the record of what time it is. If it does not tell time, then it just sits around and collects dust. That is its only purpose. God did say once, it repenteth me that I made man. The same God that says, your very noise sounds sweet in my ear. Says it repenteth me. I'm sorrowful that I made man. We were created to bring him glory. We were, pre we were created to proclaim whose time. Whose time are we living in? My time, your time. Our group in India right now is nine and a half hours ahead of us. One of the people that went said, where in the world did they come up with that half an hour? I said, they own their own country. They're one of the largest populations in the world. They can call it whatever time they want to call it. My son, Air Force officer, aerospace electrical engineer. He says, we go by Zulu time, Dad, because some people own their own little country and they call it whatever time they want to call it. You think it's your time? You were created to proclaim whose time it is. We're living, breathing, having whatever life we're experiencing in His time. Creation is a manifestation or the communication of God's glory. When we see creation, anything in it, it is intended that it communicate to us or manifest to us in a real sense, that which is invisible, in a visible sense of whose we are. In Psalms, the 19th chapter, it makes it very clear. The heavens are telling the glory of God and the firmament proclaim His handiwork. So the most basic reason that God delights in His creation is that he sees his reflection. He sees the reflection of his own glory in what he's done. In Hebrews, in Hebrews, the first chapter, third verse, it also tells us that the Son also reflects the glory of God. The Father and the Son rejoice in each other in abundance of joy. They take pleasure in displaying the glory of Godhead in what has been created. When the time came for creation, the Bible makes it so very clear that the whole of the Trinity was involved in the work of creation. Now let's look at 1 Corinthians 
8, 6. Yet for us, there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things come and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things come and through whom we live. They're one and the same. I love when I, I get to ask the question uh, in our understanding what we believe as a church class on First Friday, and we get to the place of the Trinity. I've heard it explained, well, you know, the Trinity, uh, you know, is like this or like that. I had one lady tell me once, well, it's, it's like me. To my mother, I'm a daughter. To my daughter, I'm a mother. And to my sister, I said, no, that's just schizophrenic. You're the same person. <laughs> the Trinity, what is the Trinity? And we try as hard as we may. You know, but really it's a single essence in three persons. It's the exact same source. It's all in there. But it's in three persons. There is no separate will of the Father from the Son or the Holy Spirit. They only have one will because they are made up of the exact same essence. Then we go on to the Colossians, the first chapter, beginning in the 15th verse, there we see that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Him all things were created. In the Son, in Christ, all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. He is before all things and in Him all things hold together. Nothing in all of creation, in all of the universes, nothing that exists would continue to exist without Jesus. Without Jesus. For it is through Him we have eternal life. Had He not accomplished what He accomplished, which is the will of the Father, which is the will of the Son, which is the delight of the Holy Spirit, had He not accomplished that on the cross, then the life that has been given to us, 70 years, 80 if you're strong, would be all that there was. But in Him, all things hold together. In Him, we have eternal life. As well, we find in the Scriptures that the Holy Spirit was hovering, wasn't He? over the void, the emptiness of before creation, the emptiness of before. Before there was, there was the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son. In John, the first chapter, the third verse, we see in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things that were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that has been made. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Now that creation is talking about Jesus' pre-incarnate position from eternity past with the Father to becoming humanity and dwelling among men. He's not the first creation as He was created. He's always been. Now, I don't know about you, but even after 40 plus years, August 11, 1974, I gave my heart to the Lord. I started following from a very rebellious, ungodly background. I was not raised in church nor by church-going folks. And having explained to me eternal life, I don't know about you, I didn't have that much difficulty even as a brand new Christian wrapping my head around never dying. Of course, I was young. I thought everybody would live forever anyway, right? I'm invincible going forward. When I got into stuff like this, understanding that he was before all things. Eternity past. Well, what about before that? No, he was there then too. Well, before that, he was there then too. It's, well, it's just my mind. I don't know that we'll be able to understand it on the side of the Lord. And so when the Bible teaches that creation expresses the glory of God, it is the glory of the fullness of the Godhead. Of all, there's no jealousy. There's no jealousy in the Godhead. And he didn't, he didn't create us for a lack of Jesus 
being completely fulfilling to Father and Father being completely, utterly delighted. And the Holy Spirit, they were delighted, but they needed a reflection of their glory because what they love the most is their own hopeless. They're delighted in the expression of their perfection. So they have allowed it to be mirrored. They have allowed it to be reflected. They have allowed it to be magnified. Let me tell you about something going on way, 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 way out there. So far out that it took a satellite or wherever that thing was that they shot up there 20 years ago to see what they lost in a moment. And Saturn, this week, the mission project manager who launched that thing was there. And what they saw way, 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 way out there just reflects the glory, the majesty of God. God rejoices in his creation because it turns back to praise him. In Psalms 148, and I'll tell you what, I want to I just read to you the whole of this little bit here, first, first verse through the seventh verse. Psalms 148. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord from the heavens. Praise the Lord in the heights above. Praise Him, all His angels. Praise Him, all His heavenly hosts. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all ye shining stars. Praise Him, you highest heavens and you waters above the skies. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for He commanded and they were created. He set them in place and ever and ever he gave a decree that they will never pass away. Praise the Lord from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the oceans deep. Praise the Lord. We are commanded into existence for the purpose of reflecting and giving back the glory to the creator. God rejoices in his creation because it reveals his unparalleled wisdom. The few times in scripture where it's recorded God and man, conversation word for word, talking, interfacing, one of which that I just love is in Job. Where were you? He says to Job. When I created where were you when I told an ocean to come this far and go further? Where were you when I... And he cites funny, weird things like that spider. I wonder if God sat down with Job and shared with Job about that <coughs> lake spider, European lake spider. But they had a conversation that brought Job to one conclusion. You're an awesome God. You're an awesome God. You are worthy to be. Your name is to be exalted above all other names. You have no equal. God rejoices in creation because it reveals his unparalleled wisdom. The universe is simply at work. It's a work of art displaying the wisdom and the order of not a mighty God, but an almighty God. God rejoices in creation because it points us beyond ourself to God himself. God means for us to be stunned. He means for us to be awed at the work of his creation. I love it. What did you think of that story about the spider? Wow. Wow. One story, one moment. God means for us to be awed at creation, but not for its own sake. He means for us to always look at his creation and say, if the works of his hand is so full of wisdom and power and grandeur and majesty and beauty, what must God himself be like? What must God himself be like? From our text passage in Psalms 104, beginning in 31, we'll read to the end of that chapter. 
May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles. Who touches the mountain and they smoke. I will sing of the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God. God, while I have my being. May my meditation be pleasing to him. For I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Praise the Lord. There will come a time where those who try to create an excuse will be shown that there is no excuse. The creation itself leaves you without an excuse. That there is a God, that you're not Him, and that you were created to worship Him. And those who fail to ever come to that humble place, and how much humility does it take? He is so awesome that it doesn't even take much humility to say, Yep, you're the guy, I'm not. You're Him. Not me. I mean, we look at lesser beings like the angels. And I don't know about you. I watched the herring up at the Virginia Beach. I watch that thing. God, what did you have in mind when you created that thing? I watch that thing reach out and grab a fish, and it's got a neck a little bigger than my wrist. I mean, just like that. But fish will be oh, six, eight inches long. That thing will go in its neck. This. You just don't watch it go stretching that and he swallows it. All of a sudden now he's got 10, like 10, 12 live fish. No rules in there. Not that bad. It's fun. <laughs> what did he have in mind? How many things? Sushi. How many things did he create that when we look at him, he says, he just smiled. He said, I've been enjoying this. Thousands of before you even knew it existed. In the end, it will not be the sea monsters, the mountains, the canyons, the clouds, the great galaxies that fill our hearts with wonder, fill our mouths with eternal praise. It will be God himself. It will be God himself. It is idolatry for us to worship the creature over the creator. Man has worshipped woman, woman, man. They've worshipped the stars, the moon, the galaxies. They've worshipped, you name it. Snakes, cows, over the awesome creator who creates it at all. This morning, my hope was for those of you who know God to once again just be wow and say, you know, maybe I'm not expressing my praise, my, my feeling of how awesome, how great thou art enough. And also, maybe for one who hadn't yet determined that all the splendor that they have experienced, all the splendor that's out there to be experienced, they had not yet summed it all up in an understanding that there is a God. <clears throat> Knowing that you're not Him, then you would have to acknowledge that it may be time to surrender to the one of us. And know whose time it is that we live in. And whose time it is that we will live in throughout eternity. This time I'm going to ask our musicians to come back. Have a hymn of invitation. Just invite you to do business with God this time. If you will stand with you. If you need to pray where you are, if you need to come down for prayer, if you need something.